So good afternoon to one and all, and a cordial welcome to the day eight session three of the WIRC ICSSR sponsored ten days virtual research methodology workshop in social sciences, so organized by the Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Pal Sangha's SM Chetty College. College of Science, Commerce, and Management Studies, Pawai. So data is being generated at an ever increasing pace, and it is very crucial to ensure that your data is complete during the collection phase, and that it is collected legally and ethically. So this will further aid in effective presentation of data and then the final results. So we have amongst us one of our eminent resource person, Professor Kripa Anandpur. Associate Professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, who is going to share her expertise on the topic digital data collection, writing and presenting data and results. So, ma'am was already there and she had taken a wonderful session on day five of our workshop on the topic data processing, field notes, coding and analysis. So, to share a short brief intro about ma'am, so ma'am has a rich experience in research. Which focuses on the dynamics of local democracy, governance, and interface between governance and civil society institutions. And a large body of her work is concentrated and centered around the ways in which informal customary institutions influence local democratic process and shape governance outcomes. Ma'am was also part of various projects of national and international importance. And she was also part of DRC for Future State at the Institute of Development Studies, Sussex, UK. So, currently, ma'am is coordinating a longitudinal study panel survey of seventeen thousand households across Tamil Nadu, in collaboration with the Tamil Nadu government. And she is also leading the COVID nineteen pulse survey in Tamil Nadu, that is designed to run in. Four months as to assess the impact of COVID on 10,000 households across Tamil Nadu. So, ma'am has published in refereed journals, and the list is continuous; it is never ending. So, ma'am, it is indeed a great pleasure to have you amongst us today, and we look forward to your session. And so, over to you, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, the other screen sharing has to stop for me to kind of uh, this thing. Uh, yes, ma'am. Now we can share. Okay. Just give me two seconds. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you have been enjoying your uh, uh, eight days of uh, rigorous research methodology workshop. I'm sure there is a lot of overload of information and, uh, you know, brain stops obviously functioning at some point of time, particularly post lunch on a hot day. So, uh, I would like this to be more interactive rather than the like the last time where I was actually kind of uh, uh, talking more. Um, so please feel free to kind of put in questions and uh, because this is more like uh, um, unlike the uh, qualitative research pro data processing, which was uh, more instructional. This is more in terms of trying to kind of give you an idea as to how to do digital data collection. I was told that uh, you people had actually our programming earlier. So in a sense that this actually is a continuation of that. So um, let's go into kind of what is digital data collection itself. So what is digital data collection or digital data gathering? Uh, basically, the digital data gathering or is a process of collection of uh, data electronically through the use of uh, existing technology uh, such as smartphones, tablets, netbooks, or even laptop for data collection. And uh, in other words, it's the use of digital technology for collecting data 
or information from respondents. I'm sure all of you at some point of time have taken one of these online surveys and uh, um, some sort of a digital survey that uh, you know I either for fun or to kind of give feedback or whatever way. So there is some information in the sense that all of us are familiar with some sort of data digital collection mode and we've all participated in it in some process or the other. And uh, most uh, uh, recently during the pandemic time, the data collection necessarily has been either uh, through telephone or through web modes. So in that sense, basically this actually gives an uh, uh, this thing idea that digital data collection actually is something that is going to become much more common and uh, dominant uh, form of data collection. And uh, uh, so let's try to understand how one goes about setting this up. So what are the merits of data? Why do we want to kind of shift from paper-based collection to digital data collection? You know, what are the merits of uh, digital data collection? Now, it actually enforces strict data quality collection measures, you know, so you can put in a lot of uh, um, preconditions or kind of controls uh, on the survey instrument itself uh, while programming so that you can actually kind of uh, ensure that the person who is entering the data is doing so as per the requirements of the survey and not uh, uh, skipping some questions because uh, of uh, uh, bias or uh, because they're just lazy, they're not doing a good job or whatever it is. So uh, it enforces certain strict data collection. For example, many of you, when you are kind of sometimes taking a online feedback form or something like that, unless you enter a particular question, it won't allow you to go to the next section, right? So those are the kind of controls that we can put to ensure that very critical questions that are important to the survey are not skipped by the enumerator, okay? So skip patterns, entry limits, for example, uh, uh, I'll come to that a little later, but there are certain uh, data entry errors that people can make and it is not intentional. It could be just because of the instrument or you, know, you press nine instead of zero in the uh, keyboard. So these some, some of these uh, things happen automatically and this is not necessarily a, a deliberate attempt uh, of subverting data collection, but it could be just a kind of a um, uh, enumerator level uh, uh, logical errors that can happen. And uh, this happens even in paper surveys, this happens, but in digital data uh, collection, we can have higher control over these kinds of errors. It saves a lot of time, you know, it does save a lot of time. Uh, what happens is that whenever we are doing data collection, uh, particularly large surveys, you know, anything that is more than 100, 200 kind of uh, uh, sample size uh, of a household or uh, individuals requires a lot of time entering the data back. Once you bring back the paper uh, questionnaires that are filled, you can actually now come and uh, you are now in doing the data entry process. So in the digital data collection, what ends up happening is that the pre-survey uh, activities are much more important and more time consuming in order to kind of ensure a proper digital instrument. So your more time you're spending actually preparing for the survey. Once the survey is over, you're actually getting data in real time. You know, you're almost getting data almost immediately. And then it's only the cleaning of the data that is there. So you really don't have the entire uh, burden of data entry and all the problems that are uh, um, included or associated with data entry errors itself. Now responses, as I said, is instantly seen or recorded in the server. And as a result, what ends up happening is that if there are somebody who's making a mistake, in real time, you can actually kind of see, for example, somebody has done a survey today at 11 o'clock and uploaded it. And then I'm sitting in Chennai and I'm looking at the survey that's been uploaded by an enumerator in Neil Giris. And as I'm seeing that, I see that in the last two uh, uh, survey forms, this person has made similar mistakes. 
<clears throat> so I can immediately kind of call the supervisor and ask the person to stop data collection till you know this uh, either uh, retraining is done or that person is given additional uh, feedback, whatever it is. So you know some feedback is uh, can go back in real time so that <clears throat> rather than two, the person doesn't end up making hundred uh, errors in hundred survey forms. And then we have a major problem on our hands. So there's very instant kind of feedback uh, loop that can be built into the digital data collection itself. It has different kinds of costs. For example, you have costs like, uh, uh, you know, uh, survey uh, technology, instruments, you have costs such as uh, uh, the software, etc. But say, uh, in terms of printing of the questionnaires and environmental aid is much more kind of, uh, you know, friendly, no stationary expenses, but of course, cost, I won't say that cost is really an issue here. It is more environmental friendly in a sense, uh, because you're not using paper and things like that. And data storage, this data can be very securely stored, depending upon what kind of uh, um, software that you're using, you know, whether it comes with a survey form and I mean a server uh, uh, provision and uh, things like that. So the server survey data that is highly confidential can be very uh, safely protected and uh, put up in, uh, um, you know, in uh, servers that are not easily accessible by those that are not part, direct part of the um, survey itself. Uh, data is actually uh, quite in this digital era of everybody having internet and everybody having uh, things like, uh, um, you know, tablets or smartphones. Uh, digital data uh, collection becomes easy, both in terms of accessibility and downloadability. So uh, what are the two, I'll just today talk about two different types of digital data collection process. One we call as CAPI and another one is CATI. And CAPI is nothing but computer assisted personal interviewing, as opposed to paper assisted personal interviewing, which is called CAPI, which is the regular normal way of doing data collection using a paper and a pen mode. <laughs> Switching from paper and pen mode to computer assisted, though we say computer, it can be any digital device assisted personal interviewing. So keep in mind that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the earliest digital uh, devices were computers. Then came the laptops, then came the tablets, netbooks, notebooks, then smartphone. So the digital data collection uh, uh, method generally gets referred to as computer assisted personal interviewing, which is CAPI. And even telephonic interviews can be digitized. And I'll give you an example of that uh, later on. Um, it is called CATI, Cam Computer Assisted Telephonic uh, Interviewing Process. And first, let us look at Computer Assisted Personal Interviewing. Before that, I'd like to kind of just tell you a little bit about some of the <clears throat> digital surveys that have been carried out in Tamil Nadu by, um, by me uh, in association with uh, um, my uh, co-PIs and uh, collaborators, etc. So I have been kind of involved in digital data collection for almost uh, more than six, seven years now. Um, one of the earliest one we did is actually the one that I've listed uh, in point number three and four, uh, what is called as P tracking. So P tracking was nothing but the participatory tracking. So this was actually, remember in my last class, I was telling you people about the SHG impact evaluation that we had done and how qualitatively we assessed. So one of the offsprings of that particular uh, um, intervention was that women were saying that you people come from outside and you are assessing us. We never know what progress we have made because that feedback doesn't come back to us. And this, mind you, these were rural women from SHG groups. And this was very interesting for us and for the World Bank uh, collaborators. And they said that, why don't we allow I mean, literally handing over the stick to them. Why don't we allow them to come out with their own metrics of evaluation and their own way of collecting the data? So along with the Rural uh, Development Department, basically women and child uh, welfare, 
what we did was that uh, I was part of it uh, uh, more to kind of assess it and not directly at that point of time. Uh, the idea was that getting women to come out with a questionnaire that can be administered anywhere in uh, Tamil Nadu to assess the impact of SHG movements. So to give you an example, like the women came out with saying that uh, um, their idea of empowerment, like, you know, we had those signs of, uh, remember five uh, uh, empowerment metrics I had put up uh, last time, uh, assessing the impact of uh, SHG movement on women's lives and livelihoods itself. And for them, women's empowerment was, uh, you know, being allowed to wear a salwar kameez or a nighty instead of sari. So that would for them also like, you know, so when actually the idea was that you collect the data, data is many times uh, for, you may be literate, you may be semi-literate or kind of functional literate, but your numeracy might not be very good. With the data, what is happening is that with the hard quantitative data coming in, uh, proficiency in numeracy is becoming very important. If somebody is saying 25% of something, and I am time and again noticing that, you know, the TV anchors and others completely misrepresent data like anything. And uh, that is one of the biggest challenges of quantitative data is that it, it gets, it can be very easily misrepresented. So for the women who have very low numeracy, what do we do? So the idea was that we take this and do visualization of data. So data was actually visualized and then, uh, uh, it helped them comprehend how actually they were doing in terms of various indicators. Um, so anybody wants, I can give you a link to the uh, social observatory uh, website that has more details on that. But government of Tamil Nadu got very interested in this and said that, you know, why don't we take this out of an impact evaluation mode and use it for planning purpose? Basically data, they were moving towards evidence-based data policy making. And uh, one of the important uh, aspects of uh, uh, Panchayat Raj institutions are that they need to kind of form village uh, development uh, uh, plans. So they're supposed to kind of carry out these exercises once a year. So why don't we make it in uh, uh, connection with uh, uh, the data itself? Why don't we kind of uh, try to help them make their plans based on actual data that is relevant to them at the village level itself. So what uh, generally Gram Sabhas uh, that happen about four times a year in Tamil Nadu tend to be a wish list. Everybody wants, you know, um, every other street is asking for either water or road or depending upon whatever their service provisioning needs are. And one of the idea was that, you know, by providing concrete, hard, validated, data, why don't we get them to see the data and then prioritize based on the data? Same SHG women were actually, this was an experiment that was tried out. Women were asked to kind of collect the data, both of the households and also looking at the infrastructure. We did a very extensive infrastructure mapping of uh, location of uh, street lights, location of water tanks, location of hand pumps, quality of it, etc. And then where during the uh, Gram Sabha, this was visualized and put up and then the people then could actually uh, prioritize their needs and actually do a plan that was based on actual data. Subsequently, again, in the theme of uh, evidence policy making uh, around 2016, Tamil Nadu government also initiated Tamil Nadu Household Panel Survey, which I'm, um, I'm the coordinator of that uh, and the project director of that, as well as one of the PIs of the uh, survey. So this is actually an ongoing survey. The panel survey means that uh, I'm sure you know about panel surveys. Panel surveys are not cross-sectional where you just talk to a randomly selected number of people. Panel surveys are where the same households are tracked over a period of time, maybe once in two years. So you go back to the same household. So you just, you're much more in better position to kind of track changes that are happening in the particular household. So the idea of Tamil Nadu Household Panel Survey, again, a digitally uh, digital data collection mode was that one, they also wanted capacity building within the uh, Department of Economics and Statistics, which does the data collection for the government to make them uh, savvy in digital data collection process. 
Second one was that uh, they were interested in capturing changes in occupation and income at the household level. And uh, uh, we, are, we will be going into a baseline this year. In preparation for baseline, we actually did a huge sampling, uh, I mean, listing uh, uh, survey, which was kind of an extended listing survey, which we called as the pre-baseline survey, which actually covered about 2,40,000 households across the state from both rural and urban areas and from all districts. And out of which 2,12,000 household, 12,000 and odd households were successfully interviewed. And uh, this became a very strong pre-baseline survey data for us. And um, we actually kind of uh, did district level estimates using this data. And this uh, for Tamil Nadu government actually provides the latest pre-pandemic status report of Tamil Nadu government, I mean, Tamil Nadu state itself. We were supposed to actually do the baseline in 2020 when the pandemic happened. So we had already collected data from these 2,12,000 households, out of which 1,50,000 households had telephone numbers. From there, we drew a subsample of about 13,000 households. And uh, we actually did digital data collection during the pandemic. And we did a panel survey where the same households were tracked from uh, the beginning of the pandemic, which was March of 2020 till almost June 2021, where the fourth round of uh, this thing, once in three months, we actually called these people. This was actually, uh, Tamil Nadu COVID Pulse Survey was the telephonic interview. It was CATI, whereas Tamil Nadu Household Panel Survey is CAPI, where we are actually doing it using tablets. Whereas the second one was uh, during, using digital data collection mode, but you through uh, the um, uh, mobile phones actually. So there was a very quick turnaround of uh, data. There was real-time data for the government to make evidence-based policy making. For example, there was a lot of push on uh, uh, whether the government should open up, say, cinema halls. And our respondents, you know, more than 70% said that they were not going to be going to cinema halls at all. You know, So that actually gave the uh, Tamil Nadu government uh, actual evidence to take certain decisions. There were actually also some decisions uh, that uh, on vaccine hesitancy we were able to give in real time so that they could uh, implement it. So this was just a kind of a, a, a example of some of the work that we've been doing in Tamil Nadu. So now let's see what is a computer assisted personal interview. How do you go about setting something like this if you are actually initiating a digital data collection uh, process or a survey? So it's uh, it's not it's it's similar to paper surveys basically, except that you're going there with a digital tool, uh, either like a tablet, mobile phone, laptop, whichever that is convenient to the um, enumerators or affordable, and you are actually doing the collection without pen and paper, but asking uh, questions using a digital instrument or a survey instrument, and actually uh, doing the digital survey. Now, what are the actual steps that are required uh, to kind of uh, go about doing this uh, digital data? Sorry, um, some reason. Yeah. So first is that preparing question. As I told you right in the beginning, a lot of your investment in time happens before the actual survey. Okay, getting the instrument right is extremely important. This is something that we need to kind of keep in mind that you have to get, I, uh, last time when I actually was, uh, uh, I came online to kind of give you that lecture, I was also listening to a uh, professor talking to you about uh, preparing your questionnaire, right? So one of the interesting things about a digital questionnaire is that it requires you to think slightly differently. It is no longer the paper pen mode and I'll come to that in a little while but preparing a very strong questionnaire or an instrument becomes extremely important. Getting it right is actually very important. We need a lot of uh, um, investment in trying to kind of get the skip patterns right. And uh, see, unlike a paper survey where it says that, you know, uh, if no, go to page 17, you know, you can't do that. There's no page 17 happening. We will just have a screen, right? So it automatically needs to be programmed so that it goes to page 17. So those are some of the very critical issues, the specs, specs of uh, the uh, programming itself that is very important. 
Okay. Equally important is testing the digital questionnaire. A lot of testing needs to be done to kind of look at various permutation combination. If they say yes, what will what options do they go to? In those, if there are five options, you have to go to each option to see whether the flow patterns are okay. So you have to kind of do extensive permutation combination of various options to kind of go. So for example, I'm, uh, I'll come back to that a little later, but to give an example, you might be doing a personality test. So the question may be that, uh, do you like to go to movies? Do you like to go to the beach? Or do you like to kind of go trekking? So you might say that I like to go to the movies the first time round, and then it takes you to a certain set of uh, options saying that uh, you like, uh, you know, uh, you're a dreamer or whatever, you know. Then I might think that, say, okay, if I had said that I like to go trekking, what would have been the option? So I might go back and now then could say, I like to go trekking. And they'd say that you like to spend time with nature, blah, 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 kind of a thing. So basically here, the idea is that your, your target group can be all these options. Anybody can be picking up any options and we need to make sure that the flow of the digital questionnaire is absolutely right. Then comes the pre-testing and then enumerator training, pilot survey, installation of software. At this point of time, you need the internet. Yeah? Then the data collection. When I'm talking about preparing the questionnaire, I'm already talking about not only first preparing the questionnaire, but also programming it in whatever program that you're using, okay? Then the data collection and uploading of data where once again, you require your uh, internet, okay? So let's start with preparing questionnaire. Now the CAPI reference questionnaire, as I said, is uh, it represents full detailed specification of the interview. In digital data collection, the most commonly used uh, um, method of uh, questionnaire design is the uh, box and arrow question. Uh, it is simply nothing but, uh, uh, we call it box and arrows, um, but uh, it, it's, I'll give you an example of that. It is basically saying that, you know, you have box and arrows, saying that the box will represent the options and arrows will tell you which way you need to go in terms of programming. Many times, uh, I mean, the box and arrows are very international standard, used a lot in uh, survey methodologies and uh, rigorous survey methodologies to ensure that your uh, uh, questionnaire is very kind of uh, tight. Uh, you actually can also do this in a large Excel form where you are going to write a questionnaire, say, what is the variable? Say, for example, variable is income. Income means all everything has to be an integer or it could be something else where you, you need to be like household ID, maybe an alphanumerical. Uh, variable. So you need to indicate all these to the programmer so that the programmers know how to actually program it. They cannot uh, do a household ID which might have say three uh, letters and then a series of numbers as only integer, then you can't enter your letters. So all these specifications will have to be given to a programmer by the researcher because programmer is not expected to know these things. So you need as a researcher to kind of give these uh, um, specifications. So they're necessary not only to program the instrument, but also once the programming is done to check whether the flow pattern is correct, skip patterns are correct, the box and arrows becomes very important. And I'll give you an example. On the, my left-hand side of the screen where you have these boxes and things like that, this is what's called as the box and arrow. On the right hand side, this would be a regular, um, what we call as a step zero uh, form of the questionnaire, where which is like a regular questionnaire. Do members of this household have any income? If yes, uh, go to obviously you're going to the next question or uh, uh, they have a ration card. If yes, you go to the next, uh, next question asking what kind of ration card they have. If no, you're going to kind of some other uh, question, C.3, okay? But come to this, uh, this is for the, the left-hand side is the box and arrows. This is what we prepare our uh, research assistants, sit and rigorously prepare this and test it. So there is a timestamp already. Timestamp is happening. It is and the, the, the 
instructions are in red to the uh, programmer saying that it should be indent standard time. It should be programmed to capture time automatically. You might also want to say that you want it in 24 hour format or you just want it in 12 hour format. So, you know, using AM, PM. So those are the instructions that can be given here uh, to the programmer. Now here, do members of the question remains the same. Do members of the household have ration card? Now you have three boxes or four, yeah, three option boxes. One is number one. So you hit the number one key in your uh, digital data that goes for yes. You notice that here we have uh, pro given five, number five for no. Because one and two are side by side and by mistake you can, there is always a chance in particularly smartphones or small tablets, you know, you might make by mistakenly hit one or two. So you give a gap between yes and no, between one and five and do not know or refuse to answer as eight, okay? Now the program specification says that if yes, if one has been pressed, then you need to go to C.2. That's the arrow uh, showing the next question, okay? If I then go to C.3, here in this uh, second set of questions, if they have answered that, then they go to C.3. And if they say again, say don't know, refuse to answer, they go to 2.1, which is the next question. And that is a question ascertaining the color of the card, actually, for those who don't know whether it's a priority or non priority. Now, why is this important? This is important. Box and arrows is very important because this is actually an instruction manual to the programmer to say this should be the flow pattern. Okay. So as researchers, we know what question follows what and the programmer does not know our programmer doesn't even care because that's not their job at all. It's up to us as researchers to ensure that they get the flow pattern correctly. So a lot of programmers find box and arrows easier to follow. And once we have done this uh, box and arrows, once the programming is done for us to check, it becomes very easy. You know, we can kind of keep a box and arrows uh, uh, paper format next to us and then run the program to see whether it is following after each uh, mistake. This is also very important here because even small little mistakes can be detected through box and arrows. For example, in one of our, uh, this thing, instead of like two point uh, uh, or like go to C3, the person had put C3.1 or something like that, 3.3 by error, okay? And as a result, they were skipping the question number three, C3, and going off to 3.0. So these kind of things happen a lot because uh, these are, again, logical errors. And when we are actually kind of uh, testing the instrument using a box and arrows method, it becomes very easy for us to locate where the program, uh, problems are, okay? So from... Uh, by this time, you your questionnaire or the research instrument is ready and has been um, kind of finalized, okay? Depending upon whether your uh, um, survey is going to be in English or in local languages, then you go into the process of translation. Now, why do we have a slide on translation? It's, all, it's like natural, I know my mother tongue, I know I'm going to do it in that. Let me kind of do the translation myself. But go beyond uh, research that you might be carrying it out for yourself, but you might be doing it for an external agency. It could be a donor agency, it could be an NGO, it could be a government. Then it is it, the entire process of translation becomes uh, um, much more formal. Also keep in mind that your instrument needs to be... Uh, accessible to everybody in this translated form. So the kind of language you use has to be something that can be um, relatively uh, understood by different sets of people. We know that dialects change from one district to another. I'm sure it is the same in Bombay. The Marathis that are spoken in Nagpur, for example, might be very different from uh, Vidarbha region or something like that. And in Tamil Nadu, down south, the kind of Tamil they speak is very different from Chennai Tamil. 
or in Karnataka, the North Karnataka uh, Kannada is very different from what we speak in Mysore district, for example. So dialects differ, words differ. So we need to have something that is more or less commonly accepted and have a set of options to account for dialectic changes. So generally in a very formal large scale surveys, we have a framework for translation. We take actually two independent translators who do the translation independently. Then it is brought in for reviewing by the third person who is appointed as a reviewer. The reviewer will look at both the uh, translated versions and sees whether there are any changes. Now, the same word uh, can be said differently, right? Uh, so you can, be, you can use it differently. So is it, which is the word that is most accurately uh, giving the meaning of what you're trying to kind of uh, say? Many times the, uh, the social, sociological or uh, social science concepts equivalent might not be there. For example, there is no equivalent for empowerment in uh, some of the local languages or any of the local languages. It becomes a transliteration actually, you know. So what you need to do is that you need to ensure that the transliteration is understandable. Wherever it is not understandable, you need to give an explanatory uh, passage so that the respondent understands. So then there is arbitration that happens. For example, if the reviewer feels that this is better than the other one, we take it to an arbitrator or the third, uh, fourth person who's not connected with these three people, who is well-versed in social science research and also well-versed in language. And that person looks at the uh, whatever the issue that is under contention and decides like which is the best possible way. Sometimes we also kind of go test it in the field to kind of decide which would be the best possible way of asking this question. Okay, So translation is important because what we say in English when it gets literally translated sometimes doesn't mean the same thing or the way you ask question does not mean the same thing, you know. So that is very important. Uh, it, it won't be very important if you're actually kind of doing uh, a short survey for yourself or for your PhD or uh, uh, some project or something like that. But as you start doing larger surveys, which are going to come for external, come under external scrutiny, this is very important, yeah. Then we have what is the testing of the uh, digital uh, questionnaire itself. Now, this pre-testing is extremely, extremely important. At this level, what we are actually doing is we are trying to just test the question. We're not interested in the data, okay? I'm just going to make sure that it all the elements of the digital instruments are working properly. As I said, we try to break the instrument. We will give all kinds of options and answers and things like that to see whether the skip patterns are flowing properly, looping is happening. Looping means, say, for example, I am trying to collect somebody's employment history for last two years. So in the digital data collection, uh, what needs to happen is that if I'm asking uh, uh, my respondent, uh, say I'll, I'm talking to Dr. Liji and I'm asking her her employment history in the last two years, okay? So it actually needs to capture her employment history one and if she says that before coming to this position, she has actually worked in two other places, I need to capture both. So I need to instruct the programmer saying that loop this question based on what number I put saying that this person has worked in two jobs before, it'll loop twice. If they say three jobs, it'll loop three times. Now somebody might have worked 10 jobs, but I don't want to know all their 10 job history. So I will put a limit saying that it will loop only two, twice or thrice maximum, depending upon how much I want to know, okay? So those kinds of loopings are also now tested while we are doing the pre-testing. So once uh, uh, this entire process, the pre-testing is actually uh, the most important thing. We do a, a small sample also at this point of time. It may be just about 10, 15 people we take and we ask them questions just to kind of not to get the data again, to see whether they are understanding it the way we have framed it. This can help you also test your translation, okay? As well as the questionnaire itself. 
So at this point of time, once we are satisfied that the questionnaire is okay and it is uh, this thing, it has been programmed, it has to be uploaded into a whatever software that you're using. And I'll come to a whole set of software. The one which have, we have been using uh, on a regular basis since we uh, particularly for P tracking, we had done a customized uh, uh, survey um, um, software. But uh, for uh, TNHPS as well as TNCPS, we've been using Survey CTO, which is one of well-known uh, uh, digital data collection software. And it was actually designed by a social scientist who does social science research. So it, it actually kind of takes up the nuances that are required for doing uh, an extensive digital data collection. So uh, next point is that pre-testing, which uh, from testing to pre-testing. Testing is uh, with the um, paper instrument also. Then we do the pre-testing with the survey instrument in a digital format. And this is again an internal process. It, uh, it tells us whether a particular question is sounding okay or not. Uh, strengths and weaknesses of the instruments actually on questionnaire format. Are we kind of uh, clear, you know, I mean, let me say one thing that how much ever you imagine all possible permutation combination and try to put yourself in uh, the respondent shoes and try to design it when you begin going to the field, there'll always be something new that we would not have thought of. Yeah. So this is actually this helps us to kind of think, for example, wording, there is actually sometimes, you know, if we are not very sure, what we do is that we do a kind of a, kind of a comprehensive testing of the question, particular question that we are concerned about. So I read out the question to the respondent. And then I ask, when I ask this, what did you understand? Did you understand it the way I meant it? Or in your mind, what the question sounded like? Many times, you know, based on where they're coming from or what their perception is, the question might sound very differently to them, you know. So some tricky questions we need to ask. So for example, uh, let me give you a, it's a very common mistake that we make, but this is very important. Say, usually, which doctor do you see? Now, what does usually mean? So we need to give an instruction to the enumerator. If usually means more than 10 times in a year or something like that. Most of the time, you know, saying that like in a year, like most of the time, three fourths of the time to give some quantifiable number to be this one. So there are some ambiguous words like this often, mostly, usually, uh, once in a while, once in a while means what, you know, it depends upon what is the issue in hand. So we need to kind of make it very clear that we are capturing it exactly as uh, this thing. So generally, as I said, for pre-testing about uh, um, five to 10 samples are taken. And then comes uh, enumerator training. This is extremely important in the, in the PBS when we were doing, though uh, there were two surveys, uh, digital surveys that were happening simultaneously around the same time. So some of the enumerators were actually slightly uh, tech savvy, but enumerator Enumerator training becomes very, very important. If you're running a large survey like we did, where we had like something like uh, almost uh, 700, 800 enumerators uh, distributed across the districts, and we had to train them in batches, and we had to get them out of the paper mode. Initially, what they would do is that they would take a paper, write down, come and then enter it into the digital mode because they were not comfortable with the digital mode. And we had to catch them. We were doing a lot of quality control issues to kind of ensure that they are actually using the digital data, uh, this thing itself and not the instrument itself and not, uh, um, you know, doing the paper one because then the entire, uh, uh, one of the uh, objective was to do capacity building in digital data collection. And uh, most of uh, the, uh, large surveys now are going into like including census, NSSO surveys, all are moving towards digital data collection. So digital data collection is being becoming the norm rather than the uh, exception. And we had to kind of train them and get them to think differently about digital data collection. So we had to kind of tell, show them how to download the software, how to use the software. We actually, we made them familiar with the paper questionnaire first and then showed them how does it look in a digital format. 
as I said, you know, go to page number 17 doesn't come like that. So here, automatically, the pro it's programmed so that it goes to page number 17 automatically if a particular answer is uh, entered. And also things like, uh, uh, the, uh, for example, we picked up a sample, right? So some of the details were actually kind of already preloaded into the uh, form itself. So they, they just had to enter the household ID and some of the uh, details where from which district it was, from which panchayat or which village it was, all those got automatically entered, which then started making them feel that, yes, this is kind of uh, uh, easier for us to do. Yeah. So once they then we actually had to uh, take them through the entire uh, software, uh, digital uh, data collection, this thing, make them go through everything and uh, do some mock interviews in nearby villages to see what are the challenges that they're facing? So enumerate training requires a lot of time, patience, effort to ensure that your enumerators are comfortable. A lot of these people might not be tech savvy. They might not be com uh, com you know, comfortable using uh, digital devices, but we need to kind of get move them towards digital data collection. Yeah? Then we do the pilot survey. Now, the, unlike the pretest, which is mainly to look at the questions, pilot is to look at the responses. Now, I don't want, I'm doing a 2,12,000 household survey. I don't want to roll out all 2,12,000 in sequence and midway realize that there has been a mistake. Okay. So this is not the data that we were looking for, or there is that, you know, it is coming in a form that we probably, you know, should have asked in a different way. So uh, UNESCO defines it as a survey that is conducted with the individuals or targeted population of a sample survey in order to kind of refine the survey instruments before the main data collection uh, and we target the full sample. So it is very critical for large and complex surveys as because early detection of flaws in the instrument and rectify it. We actually do about 700 uh, uh, I think in the earlier one, we did about uh, 700 to 800. In, even in the uh, CAT, that is the TNS uh, COVID pulse survey, which was the telephonic survey, we did a small pilot to see whether the telephonic interviews were working. And uh, based on that, based on the pilot survey, where we actually look at the data, you know, we analyze the data, we see whether the data is making sense or we kind of, whether we need to go back and add an additional question or change the question format. So. Even at this stage, sometimes the questionnaire might itself get uh, modified or revised. Then the pilot is setting the stage for your next uh, sequencing, which is actually on a large scale. We now actually, all the training would have been done in training forms. Now we need to kind of uh, delete the training forms, reload the software in all their uh, uh, devices. It could be mobile, it could be a tablet. We've largely used tablets uh, for the telephonic service, mobile phones were used. At this point of time, you need internet. So uh, they all bring their uh, uh, to a regional headquarters or something like that, depending upon uh, district headquarters or regional headquarters where there is good internet facility. Our uh, uh, field managers and IT consultants sit with them and take each tablet make sure that the training forms and the training uh, uh, data, everything is deleted from the uh, tablet or the notebook or mobile, whatever digital data device that they're using. And then we freshly load the software into that. So uh, once it is done, it is ready for deployment into the field. So as this process happens, each district then, or in our case, it was each district, as we finish each district, we uh, load the fresh uh, um, application into their uh, digital data devices. They go into the field to start collecting the uh, this thing. At the end, I've actually got a little bit of uh, screenshots of uh, how it looks in Survey City. Well, if there is time, I will show it to you. Uh, then the data collection happens. They go and conduct the data of the sample population. Here, each enumerator is given a code. Once they enter the code, what sample that has been assigned to them will pop up as a down uh, uh, drop down box. And then they actually kind of uh, hit that particular, maybe the first drop down will be their first sample. They hit that, then that uh, form opens up. 
and then they go to that particular household and then they do the interview. They, as soon as the survey is done, they can actually hit send that time itself if there is internet, etc. If not, they can just save it and upload it later. Sometimes they save it um, to kind of make sure that uh, there are no mistakes and things like that. Generally, we have tried to avoid saving because uh, many times what happens is that if they save and they go back and try to change the data, then uh, we don't know the quality of data. So we prefer that they don't make any corrections at that point of time, and then just this send the data to us. Now, uploading the data requires internet. It has to be uploaded to the server. And there are times when it happens that, you know, at the end, usually like, you know, initially the, some of the districts will not do it. And then at the end of the uh, time period that is given to them, we are getting large loads of data that is coming up to the server. And at the same time, we need to be downloading at our end to make sure that the server, uh, server is not overloaded. So um, that is a process that is important also from uh, the uh, researchers team uh, uh, side. So uh, what are the kind of uh, um, issues that uh, are uh, important in CAPI? Like, you know, what does it mean? Um, it actually minimizes data collection errors. As I told you, there are logical errors that are done on a regular basis. You know, somebody, for example, we were collecting annual income, but uh, you do not ask annual income for somebody like a wage laborer who gets a... Um, every day some wage, okay? So the instruction to the enumerator was saying that if it is daily, then you multiply it by seven or like ask them how many times in a week do they get work normally, like five days a week means like, you know, uh, 100 rupees into five and then whatever the number of weeks that they get, you know, so kind of scale it up to an annual income. Now, there was one, uh, uh, when we were doing uh, data cleaning and uh, data frequency checks, we found that there was complete mismatch, mismatch between, uh, um, complete mismatch between the uh, data uh, the, and the uh, income and the category, basically. It was a daily wager who had something like one lakh, uh, more than one lakh per uh, year. And we said that what is happening, you know, who is this, uh, did he get a lottery or something like that, you know, who is this daily wager who is earning so much money, you know, a little, something like 10 lakh or something like that. Then we went and found out that instead of, uh, uh, this person has actually kind of, uh, uh, you know, estimated it up to weekly and then uh, multiplied it by 365 days or something like that. So there was a uh, error from the enumerator side, which we could spot immediately because we were looking at the data as it was being uploaded. So these uh, uh, problems can be minimized by kind of, uh, um, subsequently what we did was that we stopped the uh, data collection. We revised it to say that, you know, uh, just collect weekly, and don't kind of uh, uh, scale it up to uh, annual income, which we were doing it on our own. So these are the, some of the things that you can do by minimizing data by looking at it. Large scale samples, particularly panel surveys can be very easily uh, trackable uh, through this. We, the data also collects like, you know, when we are, uh, the, as you saw that uh, when the, including the timestamp, we can also look at uh, things like uh, geotax. So, if next time a new enumerator goes to that place, because this is a panel survey, we'll be going back to that household uh, two years later, we'll be able to locate that household because we have geotags now, you know. So uh, data cleaning, uh, some of the data quality checks will take care of the data cleaning, but data cleaning is still a big issue, uh, particularly a category called others, which is a nightmare of all researchers because it's something else altogether. Now, uh, what we can also do is that the digital data collection gives you a lot of uh, flexibility to design complex survey instruments because a lot of things can be pre-filled, geotag, automatic skips can come. Uh, we do audio recording, we can capture images, etc. 
at the enumerator level, what also is uh, important is that uh, skipping of questions is automatically done. They don't need to remember which, uh, you know, how do they need to do the skips. Automatically, if they say no, it goes to the section that it is supposed to go without enumerator having to do anything. Pre-filled data is, data is available to them. And uh, it automatically records and ends uh, time along with GPS location. Very important is that uh, quality control. How do we ensure quality control? You know, so um, that person could be sitting at home and filling it up, right? So anybody can sit and uh, download it and not go or go somewhere. Once when we are actually doing the data collection, uh, I mean, you know, we are doing the data analysis, we were uh, trying to kind of see where the geo tax are coming from. And it was coming somewhere from Arabian Sea. So we had to kind of capture the call, call, call this person and say that, you know, where was this collected? You know, what were you doing? Then we found that uh, the uh, instrument had uh, some sort of a uh, software issue and the uh, GPS was not actually getting captured. And uh, we had to do the second set of uh, resurvey under supervision to ensure that the correct uh, uh, district uh, was actually kind of uh, this thing. So the first and the second one, the spot check and the back checks are the common data quality control measures that large scale quantitative surveys uh, undertake. Spot check is when somebody is actually collecting the data in a particular household. Uh, we employ supervisors or in our case, we had district managers who would actually go and just observe to see how that person is actually collecting uh, the data or carrying out the interview. Are they talking to the right person? But first of all, have they asked consent? Okay, consent is very important. People should consent to be part of the uh, research and consent form actually has to be read out verbatim. Are they doing that? You know, so one of the audio uh, checks that we do, you know, uh, Survey City allows for random uh, uh, audio recordings to happen. Uh, in our case, what we do is the consent uh, section is actually kind of uh, recorded because that's a, before the survey starts. So we know whether they're actually asking the consent properly. And also at the end of the consent, they also say that can this be audio recorded? If the respondent says no, then the audio recording stops. If the respondent says yes, snippets are randomly kind of thing. So the enumerator has no idea which questions are going to be audio recorded. So that way we can see, you know, uh, back at the headquarters, we can actually listen to some of these audio clips to see whether they're asking the questions correctly, whether they're talking to the uh, key informant who is an adult and not a child. Sometimes, you know, you might, they might be talking to somebody who's just 14 years and we have very specifically, um, uh, specifications that the uh, respondent has to be 18 years old, you know. So spot checks are done. Back check is where once the data, as the data gets uploaded, we randomly pick a sample from that on a weekly basis. And it is back checked. So for example, if a questioner has about uh, 60 questions or like uh, say 50 questions and uh, 10 key questions for which we are very uh, worried about are picked by the supervisor. So we have a back check form, which is also digit digitally designed, which contains only uh, the key questions. And they don't have any idea about what the data looks like. They're just given these questions and then they are asked to go to these households and do the same interview, but only of 10 questions. Then we look at and compare. So back checks can be that, you know, uh, the data can match. Data, there might be mismatch between some questions. And then there might be total mismatch or like, you know, so we assess it by percentages up to kind of 20%, 25% is okay. Uh, beyond 25%, that person needs to be, uh, you know, they have to re redo the surveys. Uh, sometimes they have to undergo, uh, you know, um, or do the survey through under supervision with somebody else watching whether they're doing it correctly or not. We think about whether to remove that person or do retraining if the similar mistakes are conduct, you know, continuing. 
but back check is also tricky because when i go to say i might meet uh, one person when the supervisor goes they might meet a completely different person so we need to keep that also in mind saying that who is responding is it the same person or uh, somebody else also what we do is that we don't give questions that might be time sensitive you know the recall period might be like i would have asked like what did you eat uh, yesterday now if i go after one month and i ask what did you eat one month back obviously that person is not going to remember that is time time sensitive data right so we have to ask questions that are more or less factual and kind of are uh, you know we are, have high uh, percentage high assurance of getting uh, um, accurate uh, response or similar responses audio check i already told you that uh, we uh, parts are recorded and we actually kind of thing so what we end up doing is that every enumerator gets audio checked you know and those that make more mistakes get more audio check than the others high frequency check is where we are actually the research team sitting at the headquarters uh, in this case madras institute of development studies in chennai will use uh, we use data software and we do a biweekly uh, on a biweekly basis we download the data and run certain checks for example we uh, try to see whether uh, uh, the are there any outliers are there any inconsistency between variable and data set the, like the way i told you about that uh, uh, wage laborer having very high income those kinds of things are seen one more thing we do here is that we look at the uh, um, at the enumerator level if somebody is see uh, the tendency is that if i have to answer like 20 questions and if i want to finish fast i will say no 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 and finish off the data collection very quickly okay so what we do is that if there is particular enumerator coming out with too many no's to this question yes no and no and it's over the data collection is over so we actually check if the person is saying too many times no then we we ask them to do the resurvey second the, there are what is called as branching questions yes if yes go to this set of questions say like for example you know um, we are trying to find out say uh, we are trying to kind of bring link between uh, this is also interesting in terms of uh, programming say for example we are trying to come uh, compile the uh, employment uh, uh, data of a particular household now there is a student there but might be doing part time work so we have to have a uh, question to the student saying that in addition to your studies do you do any other kind of part time work for example a lot of these children who kind of uh, distribute newspaper in the morning they are going to school afterwards so they might be doing some small uh, uh, job like that so if they say yes then the employment section automatically opens up and then they have to answer another set of 10 question now as an enumerator if i don't want if i am the type who is not sincere i might just say no i might not even ask that person that question i might just put no and these are called branching questions so that you don't have to ask those additional branching questions and you can finish it off fast so we specifically look at branching questions if too many of them are coming up as no then we target that person to kind of more spot checks and back checks and uh, we warn them we retrain them etc another thing we do is that we look at the time stamps from the time the data collection has started the interview has started to the end now we know that even with most uh, uh, sections not being answered say for example you have a retired household where there is no employment this thing they are healthy no health questions um, there are no children so no education question so the data collection can get over very quickly so we have that minimum time limit okay now if that particular time stamp shows that this person shows only like uh, 10 minutes of uh, interview but that household has a lot of people who are working or in school and the data is not showing up then we target those people so high frequency checks allows you to do a lot of different data validation and uh, this thing despite that we do another round of uh, check from the headquarters which is the telephonic check for example when we were uh, doing the pre baseline survey data analysis we found uh, a lot of uh, households reporting od that there was open defecation 
Now we wanted to make sure that this was checked. So we first contacted the supervisors and the district uh, directors to check with the households. Then uh, we went back and called ourselves some of these households to say that uh, when our in the enumerators came, you responded like this, is it true? You know, or say like, you know, if you find that a very young 15 year old uh, status is showing up as married, we don't know whether it should be one five or five one, you know. So then we call up and say that, you know, who is this person? Is this person uh, married or not? What is the person's proper age? So we do telephonic checks. Obviously, telephonic checks are only for very, uh, very visible and uh, um, clear outliers. We can't do it for uh, everything. Then, of course, to ensure that your sample is completely enumerated, the tracking sheet is maintained by the supervisors, where they say that how many uh, this thing the enumerators have actually done. Okay. So um, what are the disadvantages? Obviously, it relies on electricity. You need to charge your uh, digital data devices. You need connectivity. It might not be feasible all everywhere. Data could get corrupted sometimes before it is even uploaded. Then we lose data. That's why we like to kind of get the data immediately rather than sitting in the uh, this thing. Many times, you know, these people might take the tablet home and the children might be playing with the tablet and leading to some data losses. Um, it's more uh, um, amenable to quantitative survey than qualitative survey, but uh, qualitative survey also, as I said, you know, with data visualization, you can do wonders. Requires technologically competent enumerators. You know, if the enumerator uh, uh, doesn't know, uh, but then, you know, uh, what we really found is that uh, this technologically, technological competence is a very relative term. Now we had, I said, whenever I used to talk to enumerators who are all uh, BSc, MSc statistics, and I used to tell them saying that SHG women were able to do it, who did not have much uh, this thing. And some of them were like, uh, not even middle school pass. If they can do it, you people can't do it. And immediately that used to put their back up and say, yeah, 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 we will do it, you know. And when we were actually doing it, we had one uh, uh, district director who was, uh, uh, in her, almost uh, close to her retirement, uh, this thing. And first day when we were doing this training, she was just sitting and watching. But by second day, she had gotten very curious and she started opening up and she started doing it and she became very savvy in it. So technological competency is uh, not necessarily correlated with uh, literacy or age or gender. It could be just that some people are more technologically kind of, uh, you know, interested and they pick it up much more uh, quickly than others. So you need to kind of train people uh, with smartphone becoming almost common. This is becoming less of an issue. Getting them to wean out of PAPI method was very difficult, but now they've become so adapted uh, uh, CAPI method that they want everything to be preloaded, which sometimes we can't do. We can't do the preloads because the data is just getting collected. You can do preloads of uh, certain variables only once the data is collected, uploaded, and we have the data so that we can preload. So uh, sometimes now the challenge is saying that give us all these information and things like that, so which uh, uh, is also challenging. We also found that outdoor visibility, battery drainages are problems in very hot sun if they're standing outside, the screen is not visible many times. Uh, so it is expensive. Definitely digital data collection is expensive. Uh, also because we are continuously doing uh, data collection using tablets. Now after three, four years, the capacity of the tablets starts uh, slowing down and you will need to kind of uh, reinvest in uh, fresh tablets or things like that. Yeah. Very quickly, let's go through what is CATI, which is again, nothing but uh, uh, same thing, but now done through a telephone call. This became the most used format during the pandemic. But what uh, uh, Patty does is that, again, we used a survey CTO itself. In the survey CTO, we have an option that through the software, you actually call the household. So the recording actually happens via the software and not directly calling a telephone number. So the advantage is that sometimes everybody has telephone, you have uh, uh, access to people. 
hopefully it leads to higher response rate but it could also be that there could be you know if there is no good connectivity fall drops can happen it is cost effective because you don't have to travel and people have access to their own telephones uh quick and efficient because you know you save a lot of time but uh, disadvantage is that you know uh, many times in surveys uh, you need to establish trust a face to face interview establishes trust whereas you know i uh, all of us kind of uh, somebody calls and say will you answer some question the first thing he says no you know so nobody wants to answer uh, this thing it is also very recent we don't have enough literature on quality controls etc so we use some of the same quality controls that we were doing for cappy uh network problem network dropping uh, becomes so a sampling bias is that those that don't have telephone will not be part of your uh, survey so you might be missing some uh, uh key information itself what happens is also fatigue in uh, the challenge of uh, uh, telephone surveys that it has to be short quick and uh, up to the point we can't have very long surveys you know so our maximum time had to be about 20 minutes max 30 so between 20 to 30 would be the interviews that itself was seen to be very long but sometimes you know uh, they had to call uh, two three times to complete the interview because people would suddenly say i'm getting another call and i'm connecting this kind in the phone um and if you go on uh, if you are doing back checks and calling them again they would be very irritated another uh, challenge with cathy was that you can get access only to the key informant now if i want to find the challenges of online education i can't say call your child and i'll talk to them i'll have to ask all those questions to the key informant or on mental health issues we had challenges of collecting uh, information about mental health children challenges of children women elderly uh, because it was the male key informant who was responding and uh, they gave from their perception you know so those are the challenges that you face in the cathy now let's very quickly go to like what are the challenges of uh, selecting the software now there are different surveys different organization that use uh, different softwares every software has merits and demerits many people customize softwares because of these things but customization is challenging because uh, you know it needs to be there are no let me let me put it this way you know it's like uh, uh, every time you need something to be done you have to do it yourself whereas uh, the proprietary softwares have a lot of built in uh, uh, facilities that are very uh, advantages there is not much there is a glut of information but not uh, adequate high quality information say what is what uh, as a comparative uh, this thing so we actually put together uh, uh, a particular thing so what do you need to look at talk to people who have done a lot of surveys uh, digital data surveys talk to them uh, get their experience talk to these people who are actually manufacturing the software to find out uh, uh, this thing talk to the enumerators uh, so get to the actual uh, challenges now uh, data capture you know does it have uh, locality information geo tagging there are two things like i'm talking to the key informant but i'm also asking about the household which is a roster how to kind of a create a roster out of the main thing does it allow for those sample management a lot of things you can actually find out so you need to do a bit of uh, uh, research before uh, picking this up it needs to support multiple languages programming needs to be simple not very complicated because if you want to make changes it should be accessible a uh, mode of data collection both offline and online is better because a lot of time you, you know in very hilly areas or remote areas you might not have access to this thing but it should allow you to open up without the uh, internet connectivity to uh, do the survey data accessibility it is uh, uh, the um, data is available to that so the accessibility becomes uh, uh, this thing uh, easier uh, allows customization uh, in the download you can actually kind of you need to kind of find out whether how accessible the data is to the research team right so what is your back end data going to look like is it in excel form is it in a csv form so that then you can run your software to do the analysis does it require high speed internet connection for example when we were doing this downloading it was such a problem because you know we used to get this bulky uh, uploads 
and uh, it will download up to 75,000 and then some glitch will happen uh, in the internet and then it will not pause at 75 and pick up at 75,000 uh, or 75,001 uh, uh, this thing, uh, form, but it will go back to zero and download all over again. So this was like very distinct and we had to talk to the uh, service CTO team to kind of figure out a way we were able to kind of download. It should not consume too much data also. That is also one of the considerations. Data storage and protection uh, earlier, uh, um, uh, they were talking about uh, the privacy of data being very important. Uh, so we need to ensure that the server sto storage is uh, uh, accessible. For example, you pay for these storages and then you need to download it onto your own system so that it is safe. Uh, privacy is uh, ensured uh, not everybody should have access to the data. So all these things you need to make sure uh, about the thing and it should be budget friendly. It can't be very expensive. Most of them are expensive. Like, you know, we are expecting it to do a lot of things and to provide privacy and to provide easily accessible downloads, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually have to make sure that it is, uh, um, it, 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 it tends to be expensive. It is not as uh, cheap as uh, people think. So a quick comparison, I'm just giving you a broad comparison of various uh, these things, have that we used. Uh, so we have data capture, easy navigation, programming, uh, what kind of mode, accessibility, device, protection, etc., and the price. So um, we have uh, survey CTO that allows uh, uh, data capture. It allows navigation within the field. It is uh, It can be programmed in Excel. It is available both online and offline, mobile, tablet, laptop, all digit, uh, digital devices can be used real-time access to the data, server is based in India, it is secure, but it is costly. For example, one month subscription costs $220 and uh, it comes with 10,000 forms. If you exceed the form, you can buy the forms uh, cheaply to $400 and all that you can get another uh, uh, 5,000 or 10,000 uh, forms. But if your data collection period exceeds one month, then you have to buy another subscription for 220 again. So it is costly. Blaze is most advanced data capture feature. It is uh, very uh, useful for uh, Blaze is uh, uh, manufactured by or created by Blaze Netherlands. It uh, is best for uh, panel survey because a lot of uh, uh, data preloads can be done, uh, but uh, it is very, very expensive. It's only recently the tablet version has come, uh, but otherwise it's laptop itself, which is again clunky and people need to capture I mean, or take it and things like that. Then uh, CS Pro X is there, that's also costly. Uh, Open Data Kit ODK, most of you have uh, heard about it. Server needs to be set up. It is not hacked. You know, your data is not very safe. It is. Uh, uh, it can be hacked very easily because uh, company does not provide uh, local server. So you need to kind of find uh, this thing. Again, uh, all tricks. It's the same thing. Uh, server is not in India, so there are some data private uh, uh, privacy laws that uh, insist that the national data sets need to remain within the uh, country itself. So it, it's not uh, true for smaller surveys or uh, things that you're doing, uh, maybe on a small scale, but large surveys, definitely the data privacy laws need to be looked into. Google Forms, they say, are secure, but uh, we really don't know how secure they are because uh, uh, there are issues with Google Forms because if you're collecting some very sensitive information, we really don't know how this thing. So um, what I realized last time is that uh, after the qualitative thing, I had not given you the reference from where I was drawing my source material. So uh, for uh, the, the last class that I took uh, on, um, uh, on processing qualitative research, the book is Hennick et al, Bailey, Hunter and Hennick. It's called Qualitative Research Methods. Um, Sage publication came out in 2011. Anybody who is interested in qualitative uh, research, this is one of very good books that kind of gives you a very good grounding in qualitative this thing. All the material used for the current uh, um, presentation on digital data collection comes from uh, Impact Evaluation Net, World Bank site, 
World Bank side, IDS survey, ID survey, and uh, other kinds of decision point research, etc. So these are some of the reference material that I have used to create this. And uh, um, we have about 10 minutes, I think. So let me stop here. I had uh, like, how does survey see through or look? I can just kind of quickly take you through. This is how the login looks like. And then these are the kind of forms that you get. You fill blank form. And then we, we have to kind of uh, uh, use the server name, username, password to get our uh, this thing. Then we will get the uh, correct version and press get selected. And you can download this. And then on the home screen, you then second thing, you can go for fill blank form and then the start the data collection process. So I'll stop here uh, so that in case you have any questions, uh, uh, we can uh, talk about it. Uh, as usual, I'm sorry, I overloaded you guys with the information, uh, but uh, I thought that it is essential to know all different aspects of uh, this thing. Ma'am, there is a question by Mr. Rohit Kumar. So yeah. please recommend some quantitative methods book and a book for financial data analysis. I, I don't think I'm the right person to kind of uh, uh, give this. Um, there are plenty of research. Uh, I'm not an economist. So uh, my quantitative data skills, I'm more of a qualitative researcher though I do mixed methods, but I always do mixed methods with a quantitative person. So what I can do is I can ask around and pass on the information if I get to Dr. Michi on the this thing, financial data analysis. I'm not a finance person at all so far. Okay, participant, those who have queries, you can put it in the chat box. <laughs> So we will take it up one by one. Ma'am, there is a question one participant has asked uh, that what will be the ideal research or like data collection tool for online, like some most of them do it on Google Forms or maybe Survey Monkey. So, which is more reliable? Or As reliable? I said, it depends upon what you're doing. So, basically, uh, if your uh, uh, data is like if it is government data, for example, like you know, the Tamil Nadu household panel survey that we are doing is actually uh, funded by the government of Tamil Nadu. Okay. So it is, uh, the data is completely private. We can't actually kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, give it out. So we need to make sure that the uh, software that we use is completely kind of safe. Whereas if you are doing, say, a dissertation, which really doesn't kind of, uh, you know, um, requires that much of uh, privacy, Google Forms. See, Google Forms or Survey Monkeys have limited, uh, 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 programming uh, um, options, you know, say, for example, as I was telling you, uh, just today morning or yesterday morning, I was talking to my IT guy and talking about saying that, you know, suddenly we realized that this part time, uh, this thing might be there, you know, uh, employment be, might be uh, there for those that claim they are students, unless we ask that information might not come. So what we need to then do is that, you know, we need to ask this question, additional question. And then I was asking my IT guy saying that, you know, if they say yes, that they're doing part-time work, can the employment of a module open up automatically? So he said, if it is within one form, it can open up automatically. We can create that. Yeah. So, but in your Google forms or survey monkey and all the, those kinds of options might not be there. It might be just kind of go from one to another. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, there might be like, they might put some uh, um, uh, constraints in place, uh, which might not even work for you. Say, um, you want uh, age, you know, you want age to have a constraint, right? Uh, what, do you, what, do, what do I mean by constraint? Saying that, you know, if you're entering the age, it has to be in two digits only, not in three digits, okay? 
so that you put a constraint because many times you know our fat fingers and we are using a mobile or a, a device we might end up pressing more than one or something like that okay so we need to be careful about it so we can automatically put a constraint saying that uh, if they press 100 or like uh, 191 or something like that, it won't accept it will accept only 19 but those kind of constraints will not be there with uh, uh, your uh, other uh, more freely available uh, survey tools okay so it depends upon how complex your uh, uh, this thing is and then accordingly, you need to kind of uh, do the, choose the, this thing. As I said, uh, most of the survey um, softwares are expensive. So uh, depends upon the uh, funding also that you have. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Uh, yes, ma'am. It was as usual overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of places for you. Hello, John, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Yes, ma'am, there are a lot of praises and uh, yeah, yeah, gratitude right. towards ma'am in the chat. No, no, that's why I was thanking uh, people saying that, you know, I'm, uh, because I know post lunch session, as I was telling Dr. Lee, is the dreaded session, both for uh, uh, participants and the person who takes the session because it's really like you know who knows uh, this thing so i just wanted to give you an overview of different aspects that are important uh, and this is a lot of trial and error we have also kind of you know now that we've been doing it for six years uh, still you know it is challenging so, thank you and thanks to dr liji for inviting me also so i've uh, enjoyed sharing my knowledge with students. It was wonderful, ma'am, uh, having you. And uh, this was so many, I mean, we will not forget what you're taught today. It was really, although it was technical, but it's like, you can say, you have some kind of uh, magic, you know, when you speak, you feel like listening to you. That's, that's really <laughs> something, uh, something really, you know, like which fascinates in you. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, compliments coming for you. Isn't it, John? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yes, you can take it ahead, John. Thank you so much. Okay, so ma'am, with your permission, I invite Dr. Vijay Vishwakarma to propose the formal vote of thanks. Sure. A very good afternoon to one and all present. On behalf of the Bansangas SM Shetty College of Science, Commerce and Management Studies, I, Dr. Vijay Vishwakarma, Assistant Professor deem it a great honor and privilege to deliver the vote of thanks. At first, I would like to express a gratitude towards our management and our principal, Dr. Sridhara Shetty, for always supporting us. My obligations are to Professor Kripa Anandpur, Associate Professor, Madras Institute of Development Studies, distinguished speaker for the technical sessions on digital data collection, writing and presenting data and results who have accepted our uh, invitation and given generously of their time. I'm sure, ma'am, it has added content and deliberations. Thank you so much, ma'am. Heartfelt thanks are also due to the vice principals and IQAC coordinator, Dr. Liji Santosh and Professor Sandesha Shetty to enhance mutual cooperation, continuous support and advices, which have greatly helped towards a successful organization of the conference. An event of this dimension involving so many participants from various colleges requires immense planning and preparation. I strongly believe that the participants have gained a lot from this session. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And stay tuned for the another session that will be tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Krupa, ma'am. And it was really, you know, looking forward for more association with you. Sure, absolutely. You have yes. my contact information. Yes. So I had actually uh, said that I'll share one uh, uh, paper uh, about mixed methods. I think yes. it is of interest to the students. Sure. I have it on my WhatsApp, so I'll just WhatsApp to you. so that. Sure, you I'll share it with them, ma'am. Okay. Yes. So thank you so much. And thank again, you. Again, thank you for uh, inviting me and I've... Uh, you know, enjoyed uh, being part of this process and uh, me too. Humble, ma'am. Participants. Ma
Yes, and definitely one day we will we should meet physically. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs>